Well, turn to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. We're going to talk about prayer uh, today. And uh, Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it says this. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Jesus often chose a designated place to pray. That's good practice. That's good habit. Uh, when you find a place to pray, it greatly enhances the possibility of you praying. And then Luke goes on. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Must have been an amazing thing for the disciples to watch Jesus pray. Have you ever watched someone play the piano when you say, man, I wish I could play the piano like that. They watched Jesus pray and they said, man, I want to pray like that. Jesus says, when you pray, say. Then he gives them this lesson of the model prayer that is so familiar, even to people who never go to church. He says, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. So a lot of people think prayer is a long grocery list of asks. Uh, Lord, give me this, give me that, give me the other thing. This passage teaches us that prayer is to be balanced by a number of different emphases or different themes. You begin with adoration, Father, holy is your name or hallowed is your name, your kingdom come, you are a king, you are the king of kings. And so you begin by focusing on the character of God. Then you move into a period of confession in prayer. Jesus says, forgive us our sins and help us to forgive others. And so we ask forgiveness if we have become bitter towards someone or are unforgiving towards others. And so we confess our sins. Then we move into a period of requests. Give us each day our daily bread. That's a reminder to us that in our prayer, it's okay to make requests, to ask for things, very basic things, uh, because that expresses our complete dependence on the Father for everything. Then protection, lead us not into temptation, protect us from evil people and evil influences and from temptation. So prayer needs to be balanced. So that's the first thing that Jesus is teaching us here about prayer. But then it goes on because there's more. Look at verse five. Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. Now, that may seem like a strange request to the sensibilities of Canadians where uh, we have convenience stores open 24-7. I saw a sign in a convenience store one time that said, open 24-7 except Sundays. And they didn't really understand the concept, I don't think, of 24-7. In any event, they did not have stores open 24-7 in that culture. And that's why the guy goes to the next door neighbor at midnight uh, in order to hit him up for some bread. Come to think of it, we didn't have stores open 24-7 back in Ireland either. I can remember many times somebody would drop into our house unexpectedly sometime late at night, and my mom would say to me, we need to give these people a wee cup of tea in their hand, and we've run out of sugar or milk, and she would say, run next door and ask Mrs. Woodside if she's got any milk or sugar that we can borrow or we buns that I can put on the plate. And Mrs. Woodside would come over to my mom occasionally and she would reciprocate and she would borrow milk or sugar or bread from my mom as well. That was a very common practice in Ireland and in that culture. Lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey at 12 o'clock at night and I have nothing to set on the table for him. Just a very common Domestic scene that Jesus paints to teach something here about prayer. Verse 7. And he will answer from within. Do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. The neighbor yells out through the window. Buzz off. Don't you know what time it is? The door's locked and quit your banging on the door. You're going to wake up the kids with all of that racket. Some people think that's what prayer's like. You pray and God's like, buzz off. Don't bother me. I'm busy. 
People get discouraged with prayer because they think God ignores their prayers. Probably one of the biggest reasons why people stop praying. What's the use? God doesn't listen. Then Jesus goes on, verse 8, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend or even though he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, his persistence, he will arise and give him whatever he needs. Notice those little words, whatever he needs. He'll give him whatever he needs. See, the neighbor, the needy neighbor, keeps knocking harder and faster. He's desperate. He needs the bread. This would be an unforgivable offense in a culture that highly values hospitality to have no food in the house to give a guest no matter what time of the night he comes. And I guess there's no other neighbors around to ask. He's the only game in town. So he keeps banging on his door because he's not willing to take no for an answer. And so the guy gets fed up and he flings open the door and he says, you're getting on my nerves, and he flings open the pantry door, and he says, here, take whatever you want. Take it all if you want. The text says he gives him whatever he needs. You, you got me up now. Take it all if you want. That's the tone of the text. It's the second thing that people think about prayer. God only answers prayer if we keep pestering him. And if we get on his nerves enough, God will get fed up and will answer. This wee story is a study in contrasts. This guy is giving us a picture that is the opposite of God. This guy is not a picture of God. He's the opposite of God. God doesn't tell you to buzz off. You don't get on God's nerves God loves to have you come to him in prayer. Jesus said in Luke 18, men all ought always to pray and not lose heart. And then look at verse 11. He goes on, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? What father would play such a cruel joke on his child? What father would give a cobra instead of a cod? That's a rhetorical question. No loving, providing, caring father would ever play such a cruel trick on his child. When his child asks for food, no good father would ever give the child something dangerous. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion, Jesus says. Rhetorical question. What father would play such a cruel trick on his child like that? Yet some people think God is like that. Some people think that God plays cruel jokes on people. They pray for one thing and God gives them something bad as an evil joke. And Jesus says, God's not like that. Verse 13, if you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give? Now we're coming to the heart of the teaching of what Jesus wants to tell us here about prayer. When you pray, we're to talk to God the way a loved child will talk to a loving, wise, caring, providing father who never makes a mistake. Well, how does a child do that? Well, look at verse 9. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Just like a loving child, loved child comes into the presence of a love, loving father. Ask, seek, and knock which funny enough spells ask, A-S-K. That's how a child talks to a loving father. Now watch this. They ask, seek, and knock works in reverse order. First, you knock the door. If a child's father is busy and the door of the office is closed, the child is taught to be polite and to knock the door. A loving father will always open the door for his child. I knew a very busy executive uh, that people had to schedule appointments months in advance to see him and I remember him telling me that he had an unbreakable rule with his secretary that if any family members and a short list of close friends uh, ever called they had unrestricted access into his office even when the door was closed even when he was in the midst of negotiations a loving father will always open the door for his child and the Heavenly Father is saying, you're always welcome in my presence. I will never ignore you. 
I will never be fed up with you. You will never get on my nerves. I'll never play a dirty, mean, cruel joke on you. I have an open door policy with you. All you have to do is knock and you will hear me say, enter my child, come in. And then the father will say, what can I do for you? What do you want? And that's when the child says, here's what I seek. Here's what I need. And then the father will say, tell me exactly what you're asking for. Just ask. You have not, James says, because you ask not. That's how to pray. Talk as a child to a loving heavenly father. Knock. Come into God's presence. Seek. Tell him what you long for. And then just ask. Well, that begs the question, what ought we to ask? What one thing is the greatest prayer request of all time? What is prayer's greatest request? If the Heavenly Father said to you, my child, just ask for one thing and I will give it. What would we ask for? Look at verse 13. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? There's prayer's greatest request, the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. If you ask for it, you'll get it. And yet, how often do we ask for the Holy Spirit? We, some are afraid of the Holy Spirit. We are afraid to pray to the Holy Spirit. We're afraid to worship the Holy Spirit. We're afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit. We block the Holy Spirit out. We put electrical tape, it seems, over the verses in Scripture that teach us about the magnificent work and function of the Holy Spirit. We're to worship the Trinity, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All these are worthy of our worship and our gratitude and our honor. And the Holy Spirit is the one who Jesus says we are to ask for. So why is the Holy Spirit the greatest request? Well, here's what you get when you get the Holy Spirit. Number one, you get salvation. When you have the Holy Spirit, you have salvation. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Every Christian receives the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11 says, If the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Romans 8 verse 9 says, Anybody who does not have the spirit of God does not belong to him. So if you have the Holy Spirit, you are saved. You have forgiveness, you have heaven, you have redemption. Everything that salvation is, you have if you have the Holy Spirit. Number two, when you have the Holy Spirit, you get Christ. John 16, 14 says, He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The more you understand the Spirit, the more you will understand Christ. Number three, you will understand Scripture when you have the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 2, verse 12 says, We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. Number four, you get the fruit of the Spirit when you have the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 says the fruit of the Spirit, this is beautiful, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. When you have the Holy Spirit indwelling in your life, you have all nine of those qualities. Number five, you get the gifts of the Spirit to do ministry. 1 Corinthians 12 says... Uh, th there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Number six, you get unity. Ephesians 4 verse 1 
1 says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Galatians 5.17 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So when I'm surrendered to the Spirit in my life and you are surrendered to the Spirit in your life, we will have unity because the Spirit will never conflict with himself. Number seven, you will get strength when you have the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26 says the Spirit helps us in our weakness when we don't know what to pray. The Spirit intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. Number eight, you get power when you have the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter four, it says Jesus was full of the Spirit. He returned in the power of the Spirit. He said the Spirit of God has anointed me uh, to do ministry. So the Holy Spirit enables you to do ministry under his power. Number nine, you will witness with authority and effectiveness when you have the Spirit. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. So you get all of this and more when you have the Holy Spirit. It's like one of those all-inclusive vacations where you get the flight, the accommodation, the food, the entertainment, the amenities, the pool, all for one price. It's all-inclusive. The Holy Spirit is an all-inclusive deal. You get the Holy Spirit, you get it all. So why don't we experience these all the time? Because there's a difference between being indwelt by the Spirit and being under the influence of the Spirit. You can be indwelt by the Spirit and not be under the influence of the Spirit. You can be indwelt by the Spirit, yet you can also quench and grieve the Spirit's influence, Ephesians 4. That's why the Bible says, after you have been indwelt by the Spirit, keep on being filled with the Spirit. That's the literal translation. Keep on being filled. Keep on being under the Spirit's influence. That's why in Galatians 5, Paul says, walk in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, live by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, be surrendered to the influence of the Spirit because you can be indwelt by the Spirit and not be walking in the Spirit. So we need to put self to death and live for the Spirit. Put self's influence to death and live for the Spirit's influence. How? Just ask. And then act, ask and act, ask and act. Knock the door, Father, can I come in? Of course you can come in, my door is always open. I'm available to you anytime. What can I do for you? Father, I seek the influence of the Spirit of my life today. I really want to be led by the Spirit. I want to keep in step with the Spirit. I want to walk in the Spirit. I want to live by the Spirit. I want to be filled by the Spirit today. Father, I'm asking you to please help me to put me on the altar, to put self on the altar, my selfish ambitions. And I'm asking you to control me completely this day with your Holy Spirit. Help me every moment today to be surrendered to the Spirit. Amen. And then act. Act out what you have just asked.